Welcome to Real Vision. My name is Santiago Velez, co-founder of Block Digital Corporation. And I'm super excited today to bring uh, a crypto OG, a legend, uh, Mr. Stefan Thomas. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. So to me, uh, you know, we're saying off camera, you're like a legend in this space. It, you've been around for a long time. I think uh, hopefully today you can share some insights about your experience, where uh, where we've been and where we're going to go. Um, but before we get into that, let's familiarize the audience with you and and kind of your your background in the space and and what you've been working on. Let us know. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I got into Bitcoin initially in 2010, um, and it kind of came from a couple of different sources. Um, I had an interest in economics, in particular monetary economics. Um, and then I also, I was a freelancer for many years and I experienced a lot of friction in payments. And it seemed like Bitcoin had something to do with both of those. Um, and then finally, I'm an engineer. I've been uh, interested in technology my whole life, as, as long as I can remember. And so um, some of the technical aspects of Bitcoin also really fascinated me and I wanted to learn more. So that's that's kind of how I initially got uh, started with Bitcoin. I, I share a similar journey. I mean, I started in engineering and I started with uh, Bitcoin and, and went right into Ethereum uh, and my thinking was shaped very much around single ecosystems. Uh, and actually, it was a lot of those things that you brought to the table, which opened my mind up to concepts of interoperability uh, and just uh, just kind of this larger universe. So today I want to get into a couple of topics. First of all, interoperability is one. I, I really want to talk about payments and I want to talk about problems with the Internet. Right. I think you're very familiar with what's wrong and broke. Um, so why don't we start there? What do you think the major problem uh, that the internet has or, or is kind of an original sin? Mm. Yeah, so I think it's actually um, something where like the more mainstream the internet has become, um, the the more some of the, the worst forces have taken over. And some of the things I'm thinking of is kind of an increasing centralization into platforms. Um, where, you know, people have kind of discovered that, you know, most people don't think about the subtle economics of data and things like that. And so you can make a value proposition that might not make sense to everyone if they really thought about it. But the, the problem is most people don't. Um, the other thing that's really driven that, though, is just friction in um, uh, in the business models for for the Internet. So I'll give you an example. Like if I go to a convenience store um, and I want to buy a pack of chewing gum, I can just hand them cash and then they give me the chewing gum and I give them the cash and it's a relatively low friction transaction. Um, but if I'm browsing the web and I, I I consume an article, that article is only worth a few cents to me probably, you know, most of the time. And so, you know, how do I send a few cents? Like I can't use a credit card. I'm not gonna type in a credit card number just to pay this like one um, author for this one article. Um, People have tried to do these kinds of paywalls and it's not even the cost. It's literally the friction of trying to get through the payment process that's really putting people off. Um, and so what we've ended up with is these two big workarounds. So one is um, ads. Uh, we're all familiar, like most articles, that's how they're monetized. You browse around and you just get inundated with a bunch of other stuff that you're not looking for. Um, and you get the content for free, but it's not really free. It's, it's, it's costing you your time. It's costing you your attention. It's distracting, et cetera. Um, and then the second um, you know, way that people get around this problem is with massive aggregation. And so, for example, you know, I might not be willing to pay for every song I listen to individually and put my credit card in on every artist's personal website. Um, but I'm okay with signing up for something like a Spotify where I have a monthly subscription, I get access to a lot of music. And so um, both of those models actually are heavily favoring centralization because in the ad model, Decentralization has a strong benefit in terms of the data that they can collect, and so they can build a profile on you, and so their their ability to give you ads is is much more valuable than what it would be for a smaller publisher going on their own. Um, and then on the other side, in terms of the aggregation, I mean that's sort of pretty self explanatory that that leads to a lot of centralization because the more content you aggregate, the more the better your value proposition, the more people will sign up for your flat rate. That's absolutely, and I think I think those points are unarguable. I think we see a lot of uh, emphasis of that politically these days with respect to how large aggregators are behaving and how they treat uh, both their users and, and information in general in terms of the monetization or how they shape narratives. So it, I think it's a very fundamental structural problem 
with the internet. Um, and I think it largely revolves around what you're talking about, which is the friction and, and the ability to either monetize or uh, create payment systems that allow for this disaggregation or decentralization. Um, so you started off in, in Bitcoin. After, after Bitcoin, uh, my understanding is that you went to work for Ripple, the company, which is a kind of enterprise, uh, you know, cross-border payments uh, company. Uh, what, what made you decide to first work there and then from there go on to your current role as the CEO of Coil? Yeah. Um, so back in uh, 2012, what happened was that um, the CTO of, of Ripple at the time was um, Joe McCaleb. It was actually called Ripple. It was called OpenCoin. Um, and he just reached out cold one day and sent me a message. And he was like, you know, hey, I'm starting a company. Um, I heard you might be looking for a job. Um, you know, are you interested at all? And I wrote back one one message, one question. Is it an altcoin question mark? And he said, yes. And I wrote back, not interested. <laughs> and so, um, so we could have ended there, but um, I, uh, I, I had, we had a mutual friend, Jesse Powell, who's now the CEO of Kraken, kind of well-known person in the community as well. And I had worked for him as a freelancer. You know, he would pay me like 50 bucks an hour to, to fix up his um, online forum uh, for trading Diablo 2 items. So a little fun fact of, of crypto history. And um, and so he reached out and said said like hey you know my, I, I'm an angel investor in this company OpenCoin later Ripple um, and you know I'm I, I'd love for you to meet the team and I think you really like them and um, you should you should give it a chance you know and so um, he basically paid for me to come out to San Francisco you know call it a you know paid vacation um, and I, I got to meet Jed, I got to meet David Schwartz, um, some of the other co-founders of Ripple, um, Chris Larson, of course. Um, and I just looked at those folks and I was like, I want to work with these people and I only care about the details, but these are some really, really smart, really experienced people. And I feel like I can learn a lot from, you know, working with them. Um, and the other thing that sort of, you know, was impressive to me was, you know, in the Bitcoin community, we had this thing called the hard fork wish list. And I, you know, by virtue of being sort of a Bitcoin advocate and, and spokesperson at the time, um, I really wanted Bitcoin to better serve the needs of its average users. Like people would reach out to me saying like, hey, I tried to accept Bitcoin in my store, but, you know, it took so long to download the blockchain or, you know, my customers are complaining that they have to convert to this other currency and then convert back and like all this kind of stuff. And so I was like, you know, there are certain things that would fix those problems. Um, and for a while, I tried to help within the Bitcoin community to kind of update Bitcoin and make those protocol changes. Um, but the problem with that is that, you know, you're obviously talking about a system with a lot of money at stake, a lot of different stakeholders who have different interests, um, a lot of people who just want to use it as an investment vehicle and don't care about its payments use cases. Um, and so it was always very difficult to make any kind of progress. And I remember one day I like printed out the hard fork wish list and I kind of put like time estimates next to each line item. And I came up with like 50 years to get like to some kind of mainstream, you know, what I what I considered mainstream viable, you know? And so when I started talking to the Ripple folks, like I was kind of um, impressed that they had already implemented a lot of the things that I thought were necessary, not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, and I also really liked um, the consensus mechanism, which we may, can maybe dive into a little bit uh, today. Um, and so, all of those things put together, um, I decided to to take the leap of faith and I joined Ripple um, in 2012. 